Church, open your Bibles. We are going to be in the Gospel of Matthew this morning. I'll tell you where that is in just a minute. It's great to be together, great to be God's people together and sing together and worship together. It makes a very complete week for me, a start of a week, I guess, if you look at it from that standpoint, tanking us up to get ready to go and serve our Lord again this week. One of the things that uh, is a special thing for me is uh, every, it's two years now because of the Olympic cycle, two years is Winter Olympics and then the next is Summer Olympics and they're on a four-year cycle. And I can still remember growing up and really loving the Olympics and maybe some of you look forward to that too. And there's a certain level of pageantry that goes into the Olympics. You know, there's always an opening ceremony, there's always a closing ceremony, and the hosting nation gets a chance to kind of show off part of their culture and their city. And, uh, you know, it's a kind of a little international exploration to say, whoa, what's that place like and what's that country like? One of the things that always happens at the start of every Olympics is all of the nations come walking into the uh, Olympic Square or the Olympic Stadium. And they're brought in under the banner of a flag. In fact, I've got a picture here of uh, the Rio Games in 2016. It was uh, the one we had last before kind of COVID knocked everything cattywampus. And so the, the nations are coming in under the banners of their flags. And one of the ones that I love, this was a Summer Olympics, but one of the ones I love for a Winter Olympics is Jamaica coming as the bobsled team, right? I mean, they came back again this year to Beijing. They made it, or excuse me, to, uh, yeah, to Beijing. They made it to, to that one. And, uh, you know, it's such an irony because, you know, this Caribbean nation has a bobsled team. I mean, you, know, you can't write scripts like that. They're just great. One of the things that always is good for me is you look at the back at that flags again because, uh, you know, they're coming in and we're celebrating those nations. There's something very romantic about that, about all of humanity showing up kind of in one space and having these games together. But what I want to bring to your attention today is God has a very similar heart for the nations. God loves the nations. The nations hold a very special place in the heart of God. And he sees nations and he smiles. Uh, He celebrates those from Brazil and those from Botswana. He celebrates those from Chile, Chad, and China. He celebrates those from Finland, Thailand, and Iceland. All of the nations he sees, and he, again, has a special spot in his heart, and he has a a desire for all of the nations to know him, and all of the nations to know the love that he has expressed through his son Jesus. The Great Commission is what we use as kind of shorthand to refer to Christ's final command to his church, And Christ's final command to his church is that we're to go and we're to proclaim this love that he's expressed through Christ to all of the nations. Perhaps you've memorized the verse that is, when I say Great Commission, probably comes into your mind the quickest. And it's Matthew chapter 28, starting in verse 18, in which we are to go to all nations and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that Jesus has given us. All that we are to observe is what we are to be communicating to the nations. But did you know that there are actually five verses that are called Great Commission verses in the Bible? I want to bring another one to your attention today. Maybe it's a little bit more obscure for you. It's in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. Here it is. And it says, This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. And so we're giving the promise there by Jesus that the gospel, his gospel, his good news about what he has accomplished, about reconciliation between people and God and nations and God, that's going to be accomplished before the return of Christ. And so again, we are a part of all of that. Every church is a part of all of that, of seeing that occur and seeing the nations that will fall back in love with our Savior again. When I say nations, or when we say nations biblically, what do we mean by that? Well, the Greek word on that is panta tau ethne, and that ethne is one of the things I want you to really focus upon there, because when we say nations, what we normally think of as Americans is we think of geopolitical nations. So, so we think in our minds of a place like Brazil, or we think of our minds a place like Canada. 
And Patatau Ethne is giving us a little hint of where God is going with it. God is not necessarily thinking about nation states. He's thinking about ethnic people. And so when he says, go and make disciples of all the nations, he's saying, go and make disciples of all ethnicities, of all the ethnic people that are in the world. And so make disciples of, uh, of ethnicities might be a better way to even translate that or help us understand a little bit more about the heart of God. When we use nations uh, in a biblical sense, we are talking about a people group that is bound together by language and by history and by cultural identity. So that's what binds them together. They have a similar language, a similar, sim, uh, a similar identity, and a similar history that they all share together. Let me, let me give you an example of that. And by the way, sometimes that ethnic group lives in their native land where they were originally from, and sometimes they live somewhere else, but they still have that cultural identity that they take with them. When I grew up, one of our families that we knew the best was the Sukimura family. Henry and Mary Sukimura, we knew quite well. And they were Japanese, and they spoke perfect English, but of course they also spoke Japanese. And uh, when we got to know Henry and Mary, we learned about Japanese culture through them. We learned about Japanese food for them. I, I, I came to, to really like Japanese food as a result of Henry and Mary. They took us to some cultural events sometimes. We would go to some cultural events in which uh, Japanese culture was really on display. And so we would learn more about them in that way. Now, Henry and Mary were thoroughly American. They, they were American citizens even. But it didn't stop them from still being Japanese. And at heart, they were Japanese because they had been born in Japan. So even though they didn't live in the country of Japan... They were still Japanese by their cultural and linguistic, really, heritage. God cares about people from all nations. He has died for the sake of people from all nations. And so the church, every church, has a role and a responsibility to participate with God, to see all the ethnicities, all the ethnic groups that get a good opportunity to hear about our Savior Jesus and to hear about His love, not in an overbearing way, but in a very loving and caring way. And, and that's what God is placed on the heart of, of every church that's alive and well, is the desire to do that. Now again, we're a little church and we can't accomplish all of that by ourselves, but we have a part of that that we are called to accomplish. And I will tell you this year, that part has gotten much clearer. Because again, as you know, we pulled together a team this year that constantly was talking, praying, dialoguing, and the, 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 the direction for where we're going with our five priorities for neighbors and nations got clearer this year. And that's what I want to talk to you more about today is the nation's peace. If you uh, got this card a couple of weeks ago, it is, what our, is, is kind of our mission's direction. And it's called, again, bringing the hope of the gospel to neighbors and nations. And if you didn't get one of these, they are available at the welcome table on your way out. We would love for you to have one of these. And on the inside of it is the five priorities that we have. Pastor Nick last week spoke to you about the neighbor's peace. And he spoke to you about Vision House, also called Jacob's Well, which is a local expression, again, of a, a, of a group that does a great job of taking individuals that are on the edge of homelessness and bringing them wholeness and, and hope. And so again, we want to partner more with Vision House. He also talked last week about what, what we're calling My Relational Network, the group of people God has already brought you into relationship with, and He wants to use those relationships for you to share the love of Christ with those individuals. And so He talked about those. Today, I want to talk about the, the three that are in the nations category. And so I'm going to be talking to you today about Turks, about Connect Nicaragua, and about international students. And those are the three primary ways that we are reaching out again to the nations uh, in, in our efforts. Now, let me just take a moment off to the side. Some of you might be asking the question, you know, I, you might say, I, I've had an interest in a certain people or a certain group for a long time. And, you know, and we do something. We travel to this place and we do X, Y, or Z with those people. And so are you saying that you know, I shouldn't do that anymore and I should move to the three priorities you're going to tell me about? No, no, that's not what I'm saying at all. If God has effectively brought you into relationship with a certain group of people and you're enjoying that, continue on. 
But this is what I am hoping. I'm hoping that as we understand the priorities that we have, especially this nation's piece I'm going to talk about today, that we'll have a greater sense of synergy. We'll have a greater sense of cooperation. We'll have a greater sense of excitement because it's something that we're sharing all together. And so that's what we're hoping for, not to redirect you away from things where you're already effective, but to bring us as a church into a focus in which we, again, have a level of synergy that maybe we haven't had previously, and all that, for, again, for the glory of God. All right, let me walk you through the three priorities that deal with bringing the hope of the gospel to the nations, the nation's peace. And as I stated a few weeks ago, we have decided to adopt an unreached people group. Now, again, that is a, uh, a group of people around the world somewhere. In this case, it's the Turks. And we are, are adopting that group as a group we're going to pray for, we're going to engage in a special way, we're going to learn about. And when I say unreached people group, some of you are like, eh, I don't really know what, quite what you mean by that. I mean, do you just mean generally just people who don't know Christ? I mean, I, that, my neighbor fits that category. They're an unreached people right next door to me. That's not what I really mean when I say an unreached people group. And there's usually an idea that's a little, a little tighter definition of that when we talk about that from a mission standpoint. And I found a video that I think conveys the idea of what I mean by an unreached people group. This is put out by a mission agency called Frontiers. And I really like the way they put this together. Watch this. We're not talking about people who are lost and don't know the Lord. We're talking about people who are lost and don't know the Lord, and there's nobody who speaks their language that can tell them. There is no church that exists. There is no, uh, not a large enough group of people within that people group, uh, within that tribe or nation, to, to reach themselves. That's an unreached people group. When I'm riding through the city on my bike, and I just look around me and I see mobs of people, mobs of people, and looking into their faces and remembering to look into their faces and um, thinking, is there one of these people, do one of these people know Jesus? Probably not, probably not. If what you want to do is change people's hearts and change millions of people's hearts, this isn't something that you can do in the flesh. So prayer is really the lifeblood of our work. All around the city, seeing so many students around, uh, 11 and a half million people as I commute, the whole train is filled with people and the reality that, that less than 1% of them are Christian, just, uh, that's what really breaks my heart. And seeing the need for the gospel here. The core of the gospel is life on life. It's people, touching other people and if there's anything we can do it's to get the people that are that are here connected with the people that are there I've watched that video and it brings a tear to my eye because I know the love of the Father. And it is to be lost, not to know that love. And to think that there are large groups of people that might never have an opportunity to talk to somebody who's a real Christian, might never have the opportunity to see a church and come in and engage and, and hear the gospel and sing and, and pray. That's heartbreaking. And it should be heartbreaking for all of us that that still is existing today. I'm not talking about going to places and beating on people. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about going and strong-arming people. I'm talking about going and loving people and sharing the gospel of love that we've been given. And that matters to me, and I hope it matters to you. I'm sorry, I'm getting really emotional, but this matters to me. And I really feel it down deep. And I think the Turks are a people that I don't think is going to be easy to love, honestly. I think it's going to be hard in some ways. But I think that over time, we're going to come to appreciate this people, the, the Turks. And we're going to engage them, and we're going to love them, and we're going to figure out 
how to express Jesus to them. And I think it's going to be a very, very good work. You notice I keep on saying the Turks. And I want to make a distinction for you today. I keep on saying the Turks because the Turks are a people and Turkey is a country. The Turks can exist anywhere. And in fact, we just found out from Peter that there are about 8,000 Turks in the state of Washington. 3,000 of them are right in the Seattle area right here. Did you know there's 3 million Turks in the United States? So we have the opportunity to reach Turks a lot of different places, not just Turkey. Now we care about Turkey, but did you know that in Turkey today, there are 68 different people groups? 75% of them are Turks. That's the largest population in Turkey. But there's all these other people groups that have their own language and distinct culture. There's groups like Bosniaks, and there's groups like Arabs. There's groups that are Azeris that are all in Turkey, and they have their own culture in Turkey. But that's not the group that we're really focusing upon. We're focusing, again, upon the Turks. And as Peter mentioned to you, we have uh, already made some contact with Turks in our area. And Peter has made some phone calls, has gotten together with another one of our missionaries, Bill Clark, and he's actually gone to a Turkish cultural center in our area. Guess where it is? We had no idea. It's in Bothell, 20 minutes away. And you're going to have a chance if you go across the street to hear a little bit more about that meeting and what, ha what happened at that meeting. But we're finding out that there are opportunities just perking all around us for us to know more about uh, Turks. We've actually even met the cultural director of that center, and he's been very, very welcoming to us. We're going to go next door in just a little bit, and we're going to drink Turkish tea. We're going to drink tur Turkish coffee. We're going to have Turkish delight, baklava, a couple of uh, other things that you'll be surprised to see. I hope you'll try. Because, you know, it's, again, a little bit of an adventure here, so we're going to go do that together. And some of you might be asking the question, why? You know, why the Turks? Why, why do we feel like God has laid the Turks on our heart? Well, first of all, let me just tell you that for the last month, we have been praying together every Sunday. A group of us have been gathering together very faithfully, and we've been praying for the unreached peoples of the world. Every day or every Sunday, a new people group, we would come along and pray for those individuals. So this whole effort has been very bathed in prayer. I have a map here of Turkey I want to show you. And if you go across the street, there is a huge map of Turkey that's on one of the walls for you to study a little bit more carefully. And uh, as I show you this map of Turkey, I want to tell you a little bit about why we think the Turkish people may be a good fit for us. First of all, uh, it is a place in the world where it is one of the largest unreached people groups of the entire world. There's only two or three that are a larger people group than the Turks who are still unreached. And so, again, this large people group gives us a lot of access and gives us a lot of opportunity. Second, they're a relatively easy group to have access with. So, again, 3,000 local Turks that we may be able to form some form of a relationship with. Maybe you even have some Turks maybe in places where you work right now or, or, or places where you're rubbing shoulders and you're going to kind of perk up and go, whoa, hold on a second here. There's a, there's a person from Turkey and I, I, I get a chance to meet them. Uh, in addition to that, there is, again, an easy access into Turkey as a country, easy for Americans to be able to travel there. And so, again, that was a, a very good draw for us. We as a church have had a long time uh, interest in Muslim ministry, many of us. And so, again, that was a fit. We recently sent a missionary couple, I will not name them for security reasons, but we sent them to Turkey, and so we have somebody there right now. And then the other one is, uh, put the map back up for just a minute for me. If you look over in this coast right near Greece where Izmir is, that's where a whole lot of the early church happened, all the way stretching across the Mediterranean there. And so in Turkey is a lot of roots of the early church. And one of the real benefits is if some of us get a chance to go to Turkey at some point, we get a chance to see some of those things and kind of reconnect again with some of God's original work that happened right there in that land. Not, it was not Turkey at that time. It was known as a different place. But again, there are some of the roots of Christianity that are there, and I think we would benefit from that. Turkey is a population of the entire country is 86 million. 79 million of those are Turks. About 8,000 of those are estimated to be believers. 
and maybe about another 60,000 that are what are called secret believers or quiet believers. For whatever reason, they don't feel comfortable to admit openly that they are followers of Jesus. And so again, I want to paint the picture for you again of this country. And again, not all Turks are the same. And you know, duh, I mean, that, that shouldn't be a surprise to any of us. But imagine if we were trying to explain uh, America or Americans to somebody. And, and we use broad ranging terms like we said, well, you know, all Americans drive cars. Uh, all Americans like cats. You know, all Americans are vegans. I mean, we'd be saying things that aren't true because there's such a wide variety of people within the United States. The same is true of Turks. It's, it's impossible to paint the entire people of, of the Turkish people with one broad brush. And so again, we need to drill down a little bit and we need to be learners in order to capture this. Uh, we have been in contact with a lot of Christian workers that are either in the States and are, care about Turkey or Turkish people. And we've also been uh, interviewing individuals who are there on the ground right now. And there was a very veteran missionary of many years that said, I think he said, it helps me to think about Turks in four broad categories, uh, four broad categories of religious beliefs. And I have those up here for us now, if you'll give me the one with the flag on it. These are the four broad categories of Turks uh, in Turkey. I don't know about Turks in the United States, but Turks in Turkey would fit into these categories. First of all, there would be the practicing Muslims. And those are the individuals that are you know, very faithful in mosque, very faithful to uh, the Quran, uh, which is the religious, again, text of, of Muslims. And so they, they would, again, would be a very large group of Turks, but it would be uh, very practicing in their Islamic faith. There would be individuals who are not practicing Muslims, but would probably loosely identify as Muslims. They would probably celebrate some of the, the Muslim holidays, but they wouldn't be strict adherents. Surprisingly, there is a growing population in Turkey among the youth and the educated that are either deists or atheists. And again, a deist believes that God exists, but he kind of put everything in motion and then kind of took his hands off of it. And that would be a deist view. An atheist view is, again, there is no God. And so again, I'm surprised that there's that level of number of deists and atheists that are, that are, that are in uh, the Turk population, but that exists. And then finally, there are nationalists. There are individuals that are just happy to be Turks. They are proud of their Turkish heritage. And to be Turk is to be Muslim. So, I mean, those two kind of go together. But they're probably focusing more upon their cultural heritage than they are their religious heritage. So, again, there's these broad strokes of, of people. And we're, we're going to run into people that are not all going to be the same. And we just need to be able to identify that right away, that we're dealing with individual people, not people that are obviously in some kind of a box for us. There is a tremendous appetite among many Turks to know the gospel and to know Christ. And we were given several stories, and one of my favorites was they, they said that in Turkey there is an agency, I don't know who it is, but they give the opportunity for any Turk to receive a Turkish Bible, a Bible that's in Turkish. And so all you got to do is fill out a little form online, and then they'll send the Bible. And then this group has some follow-up with the individuals that have expressed interest and gotten the Bible. Well, they said, uh, actually, in this instance, they said, we had sent a lot of Bibles out, but we had gotten the, you know, the information back, but we hadn't done some follow-ups. So they said, actually, it was like more than like, like six, nine months since the Bible was requested, and oftentimes that's a dead end. But we dutifully picked up the phone and called. Guy answers on the other end, hey, is this so-and-so? Yes, that's so-and-so. And they said, uh, we were wondering if you received the Bible. Yes, I did. Well, what did you do? Did you, did you have a chance to read it? Yes, I did. All of it. And he said, oh, well, what did you think? I believe. And he said, whoa. And so he said, you know, let's get together right away. So they, he said it was in a town quite far away. So they managed to get their schedules together, met in a coffee shop, and he confirmed, yes, this guy was so hungry that he actually received the Turkish Bible, read it, and said, I believe that. And so they had the chance to walk through with him uh, some basic first steps of the faith and, and, and connect him with a church. And, 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 and that's not uncommon that's happening. There's a lot of coffee house ministry that's happening in Turkey right now. And one of the people that runs a, 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 a coffee house uh, that, again, they're, they're using that platform in order just to talk to people, said it's not uncommon we would have 20 spiritual conversations a week in that coffee shop and where in, interested individuals are really paying attention to the gospel. So, you know, again, how is this going to transform or how is this going to move with us? It's going to start by learning. 
And we're going to have to learn about something that we've never really thought about before. We're going to have to learn about a culture of people. We're going to have to learn about the history of a people. We're going to have to learn about the language of a people. And I want to start today with introducing you with one word that's a Turkish word. It's the only one I know, so it's the only one I can help you with. And it's hello in Turkish. Here it is right here. And uh, this beautiful woman here is a Turkish woman who's inviting us again. Won't you come and learn my language? And the hello in Turkish is merhaba. Can you say that with me? Merhaba. And I don't, I don't know if this is like anything, but as I've met people in, in, in from, that are Turks, or I've seen them even online, there's often times in which there's kind of a gesture that's this gesture. It's, it's kind of a gesture of, it's a welcoming gesture, merhaba. And so again, we're just learning all the tonation. We're learning the way that we would greet somebody in their language and express interest in them. Every time you're learning language from somebody else, you're expressing an interest in them. And so you're going to go across the street in just a few minutes and you're going to greet each other with merhaba. And you're going to do that as a way of saying, Lord, I am open to what you're doing among the nations. I want to be a part of it. Now again, how this all plays out, I have no idea. But what I do know is we've made a lot of contacts in Turkey already. And there's Turkish ministries that are saying, I, I've asked the same question numerous times. I've said, if you were us, what would you do? And they said, get on a plane and come here. You cannot learn unless you're on the ground. And so I think it's likely that Peter and, and me and perhaps Phil Kono, who is the captain of this uh, Turkish outreach group, uh, we may get on a plane sometime in fall and, and go and, and just learn something about Turkey and learn what are the ways that we could continue to engage as a church. I will tell you, uh, prayer. Pray, pray, pray. There's, there's nothing that we can do that will be effective if we don't have that bedrock of prayer. And so I would anticipate in coming weeks and months that we'll have prayer uh, times, a prayer emphasis in which we really pay attention to the Turks as a people and we pray for them. Because I, I, I firmly believe, again, they've been a resistant people for a long time to the gospel. And so, again, there's going to be some things that need to break down in order for the gospel to really go out and be effective in the country. All right. Where will this all lead? I have no idea. But I'm so excited for the adventure. And I believe that God has placed this on our hearts. And so here we go. We're going to do something related to the Turks. And I'm excited to see where this may land in you know, five, ten years from now. God only knows. All right. The next thing I want to bring your attention is our connection with Connect Nicaragua, and that is with Katie McGrew. That's the second of our priorities among nations. And Katie McGrew, as you know, was a missionary sent from CCF, and I told you about her two weeks ago. I also showed you a video from her two weeks ago. So I just want to leave that as a little bit of a placeholder and say that's part of our nation's strategy is to send individuals to Nicaragua Again, it has so many advantages for us. It's an easy place to get to. Katie's there, which is very welcoming and helping us to understand what it means to minister cross-culturally. Language is relatively easy with Spanish, uh, much easier than obviously Turkish would ever be for us. Hola, hey, I can do that one really quick. That's good. Uh, you guys all know that one too. So, I mean, hey, look, we got a head start. Uh, anyway, Nicaragua is a kind of a, put that a, a pin on that. That's a, a part of our efforts also. And so it leads me to our third priority when it comes to bringing the hope of the gospel to the nations, and that is international students. And international students represent God's hand that has brought individuals from all over the world to our own backyard. There are students right now at UW. There are students right now at Edmonds Community College, right now at Shoreline Community College, from all over the world, many of them from places in which we could not send a missionary or we could not talk openly about the gospel. We have some students that we were spent some time with a couple of years ago now. In fact, I have a picture of them here. They were from Yemen. If you give me the next slide. There they are. And uh, these students spent some time with us. And, you know, we got to know them. This was around Christmas time. And there was, a, you know, an openness for them to come to our home, an openness for us to engage together. And, you know, it was, it was wonderful. It was good. It was, it was healthy and whole. And those kinds of opportunities exist all over the place if we'll just look for them. There are two ladies that I love and respect very much who want to help us understand why engaging international students has been so meaningful for them. 
I have a video of these two ladies. Watch this. Brian and I have had international students in our home uh, since our children were very small when we lived in Colorado. And it started with Japanese students and we actually had them live with us, which was a wonderful, wonderful experience. It was so great for our children uh, to grow up having um, somebody from a different culture, a different part of the world as kind of their pseudo older brother or sister. Uh, that was such a wonderful experience for us to be able to have them in our home and kind of live life together. Uh, we've also been involved with international students here in uh, the Seattle area probably more in the context of being host parents. So we would uh, be a host family to international students. Uh, we've had the opportunity to host from all over the world, from Afghanistan to Yemen and to various other countries, where we simply have them over for Thanksgiving or for Easter, uh, for a game night. Um, it's been such a rich time to learn about their culture, to pull out maps and have them show us where they live, to hear about their families and uh, their faith. And it's been a great opportunity for us to share our lives with them and to show them, actually show them, uh, the love of Christ and to befriend them, get to know them, get to know uh, their culture and their country. And it's been truly a joy and a blessing to us. My name is Mary Hudon and I'm the International Student Coordinator for King Schools and the designated school official for the Department of Homeland Security. And I began my role a couple years ago here and at King's um, and wasn't expecting to take this job, but um, I have some colleagues that said I should because of my past and my history with being in the Middle East for many years. And I wanted to share with you that the impact that it's made on my life is significant. I have currently about 18 international students from all over the world and um, pretty much five countries. I see them every morning, I feed them almost every lunchtime, and um, we'll be having them at my house often. Um, we have had extremely um, fun experiences where the students are able to experience places that they've never been, um, coming from China and Taiwan. Uh, Brazil and um, Korea and um, in Ethiopia and we've had experiences on both sides so they've never carved pumpkins before so we did that one month uh, they never had an Easter egg hunt we've just finished doing that um, a lot of the kids um, have never experienced Christmas in, in the true form of how we experience that so I always have an event and then church um, but on my part, I have learned how to share life with them and learn um, about different things that they love. And so just recently I went and had boba tea, which I didn't even know what that was. And um, once I learned what it was, we ended up doing a fundraiser here. I learned how to make boba tea for 66 students. <laughs> and it was really fun. Um, so um, yeah, it's been a great experience to learn about different cultures. Um, students learn about what we do here in America. Um, I, I think that they're probably the bravest, most courageous students I've ever known. Um, they're away from their families. They're away from um, everything that there's familiarity in. And frankly, they have to, at teenage, level they have to do most of the work themselves so tuition paying um, for different things they do that themselves most of their family members don't speak English and they're not here and so I have to say that it's been one of the greatest experiences that I've had being a part of what God's doing here at King's but mostly just being a part of uh, a cross-cultural experience that I think God had planned in advance for me wouldn't that great and Mary's right back here. Uh, she, I was very surprised to learn that there's that many international students that are coming to King's High School now. And uh, Mary is uh, always open for you to uh, have some of those kids would stay with you. And in fact, she's working with another gal this summer, starting pretty soon, in which there are uh, five students that are coming from Spain. And they're ranging in time from Spain from two weeks to about two months. 
And so if you would like to give a shot at trying to uh, engage an international student, that's a kind of a short time to be able to do that. If you have an extra room in your home, and you can see Mary and talk more about that, and we're going to be hearing more about how we can partner with uh, Kings in the future. That may lead me into uh, some ways that we can engage international students, because I think there's three primary ways. I have that on the screen for you right here, and it's three. You've heard them already, but I want to kind of give them labels. A homestay is where they stay in your home. All right, I know, realize that's not for everybody, but if you're going to try that, try it for a short amount of time. Try it for a week or two. See how it goes. See what that rhythm feels like for you. Denise and I found out when we were younger, that was actually very easy for us because they just did everything we did. And so that, that was kind of a, a good rhythm. Uh, a host family says, I'm going to take a special interest in that student once or twice a month. I'm going to have them come over. I'm going to engage them. We're going to maybe eat a meal together, play some games together. I may take you down to Pike's Market or take you skiing or something like that, have some fun, but I'm just going to be a host family to you. And we've traditionally done that with Edmonds Community College. They've had a very good program for that, and we've participated in that way. Maybe some of you would like to try that. And then the lowest level that's just easy access for everybody is called Talk Time. And it's simply one day a week where you go and speak with international students who want to learn English. That's why they're there. They want to learn English. And so talk time is held at Edgewood Baptist Church. And uh, that happens every week. And it's a chance to go and meet some international students. That doesn't take much effort at all. And so again, that is something I think that all of us could do. I want to specifically speak to those who are in middle school or high school or college. If you are in a school right now, chances are good that you have an international student somewhere around you. And one of the key ways that you could tune in to what God's doing is take an interest in that person. Other people, I guarantee you, think that person's weird or think that they're odd or different. You simply saying, I will befriend this individual is a, a move of the gospel. It's a move of love. And God will smile on those efforts. So look around you and find out those individuals that God has already placed around you. All right. There's a couple more things I want to do. One of them is to explain to you how we've organized this. We have five priority areas, and we're having five team captains over each of those areas. I've got those team captains up here for you now. Vision House is going to be team uh, co-chaired, actually, by Mona Rosendahl and Barb Larkin. My relational network is going to be Pastor Nick that's going to lead the charge on that. Phil Kono is going to lead the effort with the Turks. Connect Nicaragua is going to be Pastor Eric. And we do not have a team captain yet for international students. We're praying about that, and we're interested in somebody that will take that on. A team captain really is just somebody that kind of keeps the, 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 the pot stirred, as it were, the ball moving forward, and provides an opportunity for us to engage in meaningful ways with those priority areas. All right, on the back of your card is one more thing. And if you pull your card back out at some point, you'll notice there are three words. I've got those on the screen behind me. And they are learn, serve, sacrifice. And that's what we're asking everybody to do in some way. You cannot do all five. We know that right now. But maybe as I've talked today, or maybe as you heard from Pastor Nick last week, there are one of those areas that's really resonating with you. It's like, yes, I've got to try that. And if, if that area is of already something the Holy Spirit's saying yes to try, start by that first step. Learn. Learn something about that people. Learn something about the situation where they find themselves. Learn something about how you may engage in that way and then take that next step, which is serve in some way. And I guarantee you, if you do that and God's in that, then, then God's going to lay it on your heart to sacrifice in some way. That will just happen. But it starts off with the baby steps that all of us are going to learn how to take. Well, this is an exciting adventure. It's, uh, it's going to take us into territory that I know that we've never even thought about before. And it's going to transform our lives as much as it transformed the lives of some other people. And so I'm very excited for this and to be in this together. And I'm asking you to pray earnestly about this one because it matters so much to our Lord. We are participating with our Lord in seeing the gospel go to all ethnic groups in the world for his glory. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for laying this on our hearts, for meeting us in such tangible ways and giving us something that's so, quite frankly, exciting that we get to lean into for your glory. We are taking our eyes and we're placing them on the fields that are ripe for harvest and we're praying that you would 
make laborers, lift up laborers to go into the field that is ripe for harvest. Thank you, Lord, that you have chosen to participate with us, to have us participate with you in this global work. And we humble ourselves before you today and say we can't do it in our own power. So Holy Spirit, work among us, quicken us, make us alive, make us vital for your purposes. It's in Christ's name we pray. 